meaning don't trust her, I don't trust Barbara Biddings. Um, to me, the feud seems to have stemmed from the days of the latter, when they, Barbara was really trying to move the Daughters of Blightus to be more political. And Barbara Greer at that point was using a pseudonym. Um, and I, there were probably, it was probably both personality, which we know really <laughs> has, has fueled a lot of feuds in every city in this country, not just Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> so some of it would have to be personality. But I think also it might have been this difference of politics. While Barbara, in any definition of the word, would be considered feminist, her first allegiance was to the gay movement, not to the feminist movement. So in making some of those declarations and also being much more in, in the streets approach, in the streets with dignified clothing and all of that, but still in the streets, that was a real radical shift. And there were debates in the pages of the latter, including her allowing Frank Kameny to use the pages of the latter to debate these issues that likely sparked some really differences of, of style and everything. But the bottom line, it felt very personal. It wasn't evidence-based. Like she didn't say, don't trust Barbara Giddings because of. It was really just, don't trust her. I don't trust her. I don't know what her motivations are. And um, I, don't, I don't really have an answer. There's going to be a biography. I think there's a biography of Barbara Greer uh, coming out, um, if I'm not mistaken. So that probably will have much more meat <laughs> about that feud. <laughs> Well, I can shed some light on that. Uh, uh, Barbara Giddings would tolerate no separatism because I remember inviting her to the first lesbian dance that we had uh, in West Philly. She, absolutely not. But mm -hmm. It was gay, it's gay, gay. Right. And Barbara Greer was, uh, in all fairness, a very thorny person, and Barbara Giddings was not thorny. But she had a very sweet side, but also a very strong. Right. She had a strong will. Yeah. Strong will. She had a strong will, and what was in, so what was if anybody didn't hear it was mainly the, the anti-separatist approach, and so that was it. She would not, she did not like it when we as a community separated based on gender. She, she was a peacemaker at the memorial service. So I forget maybe it was Matt Foreman, but someone said that when the men and women began fighting, she would say to everyone. We must remember we're homosexuals first and male or female second. So she really was a peacemaker in the movement. She really felt like her gay identity was where she felt the most discrimination, not her female identity. She also said there were plenty of people working, and plenty yeah. of women working on women's rights, and there weren't as many women working in the gay rights community, so it was her chance to have those bridges solidified. She wasn't as needed in the feminist world by the late 60s, early 70s, there were thousands of women across the country working. There may have been dozens of lesbians, openly lesbians, working within that co-gender movement by the late 60s. So, She did come to radical lesbian meetings, though, once in a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. As a radical lesbian, are you speaking from experience? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't big ha, ha, ha. No, 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 I'm just, I mean, I, I, from what I know of Barbara, I just, as far as the gay movement, because I'm studying a lot of history, and this is like my wet dream, to be quite honest. Um, just knowing all this and, and learning about it and, and things like that. And I, you know, she found, I think she found that the gay movement was where things were going to change the most before the lesbian movement, meaning that our society is very male dominant as well. Um, I mean, at, at least less stuff like, because she would come, you know, like, because gender didn't matter after a certain point, I don't think, because especially in her later years, because, you know, I'm the one who would talk to her a lot during the film festivals and things like that, and she would be at the smallest, uh, most obscure trans documentary that you would, that I was like floored to see her there, um, as well as you know gay films, lesbian films, like whatever. Like it was just kind of like across the board. Mm -hmm. um, that's my two cents on that. Mm -hmm. Pat, did you want to? Add well, something? she did explain further that uh, in educating me uh, that. There were more differences between gay people and heterosexuals than there were between men and women, so we should not separate. Mm. And as a Quaker, I must say separatism is a, is a hard pill to swallow, but it was absolutely necessary at the time. Mm -hmm. And we weren't welcome as lesbians, if you remember Betty for Dan trying mm -hmm. to right. uh, expel us from, right. the, from now and all of that. And by the way, let's take a moment to remember Sidney Abbott. Yes. I mean, she died mm -hmm. but yeah. April 15th in mm -hmm. a tragic way. And mm -hmm. uh, yes. she, she was wonderful. Yeah, no, very true. And in Chicago's community, too, there was this need for some women needed to have that separate space 
and the sexism was the sexism, the racism, the classism is was also very difficult. Somehow Barbara managed to not let that push her away, right? And and her and Frank were so necessary to one another. Like without Barbara, Frank's uh, personality would have been far too abrasive in some environments. And so Barbara, Barbara had the char charisma and the smile to, to, to kind of uh, <coughs> mitigate Frank's abrasiveness sometimes. And, but they both, they just needed each other. And so that complement for our movement, I think, really helped propel our movement forward by seeing men and women together and also insisting on the demonstrations at Philly be co-gender. Um, so the times when they could be co-gender, I think were very important um, to Philly and to national movement. Uh, we can't take it lightly that she was able to navigate that sexism to fight for rights, and Frank knew he needed her. <laughs> he, they both kind of needed each other. I don't know if we want to add something to Michael. Michael's the author of the new Frank County Letters book, Out for Good. No, I, I, I wholly agree. Frank was acerbic, uh, acrimonious, abrasive. Is there any right. word that <laughs> <laughs> possible? <laughs> but uh, I really agree that he needed Barbara in order to access certain places in order to <coughs> and execute certain ideas and policies. I would say um, one thing. Do you think they met, Tracy? Because I don't. No. Okay. She, what I was most touched by is Barbara and Kay were my greatest supporters in the gay movement. You know, I sort of self-destructed at the night of Stonewall because I took Jesse Jackson's line that rocks through windows don't open doors because I heard about flaming trash cans going through windows. I said, oh my God, a tenement burns up, a little old lady dies, and we're the bugaboo people of the 1970s. I did not see, no one foresaw that this riot is this unlicensed mafia run, sly, sleazy bar would somehow capture the imagination of the thousands of people that we had been trying to reach and try to motivate. We didn't, I gave up on the movement. I went to fight for abortion rights with the Sex Freedom League. I organized Lemar with Allen Ginsberg. I opened a button store against the war in Vietnam. I went into other movements. The gay movement was my home movement, but I feel that I grew out of it. I saw bigger issues facing our society. I felt so relieved when Stonewall happened because suddenly where there was no one but me, there were hundreds and thousands of fabulous articulate young people like Marty Robinson from GAA. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and I'm trying to think of who would be a very good example of an outspoken lesbian spokesperson. I remember Del Martin who... Carla J. <laughs> oh, yes. Car well, Carla J. I didn't know because I think she was more of a... But, but one thing was what great about... They only saw Del Martin in a dress one time, and that was at a meeting in Washington, and some guy, some bigot, came in with a huge tube of Vaseline and said, I have Vaseline for the queer rabbi. I have Vaseline for the queer rabbi. And Del Martin marched over in, in a dress. We'd never seen her in a dress before, and she weighed about 300 pounds and literally stood on his toes and leaned forward. And that, I think, was the defining moment in my mind of her being a real hero. <laughs> but Barbara, Barbara and Kay, as you said, really kept you... And they talked about the lies. That, what people don't appreciate is Barbara was the real builder of the movement because she talked about the lies in the library. And I was one of those who went to the library and only found case histories of piano teachers seducing their, their students in 1872. And she made it an issue to try to get knowledge and information in those places where people would look... Organizing the A Caucus of the American Library Association has implications far beyond a lot of other things, and yet it's totally unappreciated, mm -hmm. ground laying work that really built this movement. And that's what Kay and Barbara de What's devoted great themselves about those to. Gay librarians is they had just started their group, and they welcomed Barbara in. Right. right. They, again, as a non-librarian, they saw in her something that was going to help them kind of boost it to the next level. And they allowed her to lead the organization, to really be a face of the organization. And I, that's a, that's a, I know a lot of professional organizations that are totally, would never accept somebody from the outside right. uh, trying to change them. But what and, she talked about, or he talked about uh, being shown up at an obscure trans film festival, Bar, you know, knowledge is power. And if you're informed about an issue, mm -hmm. you can become a spokesperson. I ended up being a spokesperson on the New York Times, transgender. 11-minute uh, report that was on the front page of the New York Times uh, news section a few weeks ago because I've been involved with Marsha B. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera and I've transformed from being 
really a horrible misogynist into being a, a champion. I don't think the world's going to be saved till we get, like the women, I went to the Indian women's demonstration, I made a big point of that. But I went there and for the first time in my life, 70 or 80 percent of the people there were females. They were Indian women protesting the recriminalization of homosexuality in India. And of course, they're doubly oppressed because there they're forced into arranged marriages. I have an incredible documentary called Who I Am about a lesbian. She tries to get out of India with her lover. The family hires people to catch up with them, kidnaps her lover, takes her back forcibly to put, be put in an arranged marriage while she manages to escape India. The things that happen to women in the world and especially to gay people also, especially in foreign countries, are horrendous beyond our imagining. I'm sure Barbara would be working on some of those issues uh, if she had been like today. Uh, Rich and the um, Two things occur to me. I wonder if Barbara did make a uh, make comments about um, the Vietnam War, about feminism, and about the black civil rights movement. And two, was there communication, mentoring, whatever, between Barbara, Frank, other people, and what was going on in Europe? I, I don't know if you have a lot of letters <coughs> with other countries. I don't. I don't see a lot of. Um, she may have traveled. She may have done some of that. But almost everything I have is is United States.